got good news. We'll get, we'll get started. Um, it's a little bit after 6.30, I realized. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Bob Surridge. <laughs> Until the uh, president of the Southport Historical Society. And I'm going to call this member meeting to, to order. Right? And uh, welcome you all to uh, <clears throat> the September meeting of the Southport Historical Society. Uh, I, we have a number of new members who have joined the society lately, and I suspect they're, they're out, out there. This would be the time if we were in the community building where I would introduce Introduce every all of the uh, all of the new the new members. Uh, so just consider yourself introduced and part of the part of the gang, and uh, we'll go from there. Or if you better yet, why don't you unmute and say hello to everybody. say hello if you are a new member. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pam Schottenfeld. I'm a new member. <laughs> Thank you, Pam. <laughs> I've really been enjoying all of these programs. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Move, any other new members out there? And is, um, if not, Pat Kirkman, are you online now? Yes, I'm here, Bob. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, I noticed you just came in. We just got we just got started, and I I wonder if you would give us uh, a blessing. Yes, yes, yes. I will do that. <clears throat> Even though we don't have food to bless tonight, uh, let's have a moment here to um, to speak to our Father God. If you will join me. Father, we do thank you for an opportunity to be together even in this unusual way. And we ask for your protection, for your blessings, on, especially on this special place where we live. And for our country and our leaders, we give you thanks. Amen. And now I would like for you to have a moment of silence, please, for two of our previous members. First of all, John Swain, who has passed away. And John and his wife, Pauline, were among the first charter members of the Historical Society in 1976. And so we would like to remember John, and secondly, we would like to remember Larry, Larry Meisel. Larry was a president of the society for several years. He was archivist and a board member, and he has passed away also. So if you will join me now in a moment of silence for these two men, who have in the past been very beneficial to our society. Thank you. And now we're back to you, Bob. Okay, thank you very much, much, Pat. I'd like to uh, ask, Lee, ask you all to unmute yourselves so that we can do the Pledge of Allegiance to, together. Stand up. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America. and, and to, to the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation, one nation God, 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 indivisible, indivisible, indivisible liberty, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you, every, everyone.
I'm going to ask Liz to talk about upcoming classes and, and presentations. But first, I want to take a little, a little time. I, I just want to, want to say how, how proud I am of the, I've always been, of the Southport Historical Society, and especially the, volu the volunteers who, uh, since April, um, we've taken advantage of the technology that is available to us. Uh, and we've, between April past and December, we will have completed 54 online classes and present presentations. Uh, we started doing those with the idea that it would be our way, the society's way of helping people uh, through the through the pen the pandemic through being at, at home and not being able to uh, you know come here tonight and have a a potluck potluck dinner and be be together. But we saw the classes as a way that people could could keep active and also engage with the with the community. And I I've got to say we were I think we were we we did the right right thing because of those 50 probably 45 or so programs right right now we've had thousands of people participate in those programs either participate live like you you're doing or re watch the recordings of those those programs uh, that are on Facebook or or you YouTube and it literally the number is in the, is in the thousands and one measure of the of the impact and I think a positive measure that, that says that we that our volunteers are just doing a, a great job we have 100 new members of the or close to 100 new members of the Southport Historical Society from January when our membership was 232 or so to today when it's 330 uh, plus plus members. Uh, I think that's just just an indication uh, that people are approving of what the, our volunteers are are doing. So I think as a as as members and and volunteers of the Southport Historical Society, we can give ourselves a a little pat pat on the on the back. Uh, with with that, I'd like task Liz to talk about the upcoming uh, programs and most most not all of these will will continue to be to be virtual programs. Liz? Okay um, before I start I do want to mention um, I'm sure uh, all or most of you noticed today that two emails came out from the Southport Historical Society today one saying that the meeting started at seven o'clock, which was wrong, and another one saying that it started at 6.30, so thank you for the people that mentioned that to me. Um, that's not the first mistake I've made lately. Uh, before I, when I went to do the programs for September, I had some August dates in the email. So uh, I, I, what's that saying to me is that I could use some help. We've been working on all these programs, and as you'll see, we have some great programs coming up, um, but between putting the programs together and arranging for um, speakers, um, I'm having a little trouble staying organized with the emails. So if anybody out there would like to help me um, get the emails out, uh, if you can do it from home, we can collaborate, it should be fun, um, but I really could use some help. So if you think you might be able to do that, um, send me, a, drop me a line at info at southporthistoricalsociety.org and I would appreciate it. So now we have a lot of good uh, programs coming up. The first ones I wanna talk about is um, uh, they're brand new. Uh, it's a brand new series that we're starting. It's Living Voices of the Past. Now, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar that over the, the past few years, we've done Living Voices of the Past in the cemetery. Um, Yuzette Steck, who is here with us tonight, uh, would always organize a wonderful afternoon in October when we could do that, and people would come out, and it was wonderful. And we really didn't want to lose that this year, even though 
we couldn't invite people out to the cemetery. So what we're doing is we're making it virtual. We're having one program a month uh, for, ever, for as long as we have um, people we want to introduce you to. And uh, we'll have uh, the short video like you would see if you were in the cemetery. We are filming them on location. And then uh, we will round out that presentation uh, with a more traditional um, speech presentation like we've been doing that will give you a little more background information. So we think it's going to be really exciting. It's also going to allow us to broaden. So we're going to have some people um, uh, from Bald Head. We're hoping to have some people from JNS Cemetery. Uh, we may include some other cemeteries. So that's one of the advantages of being virtual. Uh, in October, October 6th, our first one will be Annie Sophia Drew Price Harper. I'll be portray portraying her. She was 17 years old when the Civil War broke out. And I'll be talking about her life before, during, and after the war. Um, in November, November 3rd, they're always the first Tuesday of every month. So, so November 3rd, uh, Bob Surridge will be portraying Mayor Leonard T. Gaskell who, uh, like, he was a mayor, he was a postmaster, and he was from Pennsylvania, so he's kind of a kindred spirit of Bob's. And then in December, uh, Pat Kirkman will be portraying Kate Stewart, who everyone knows as, you know, the heroine of Southport and um, uh, a groundbreaking woman in Southport who you know, was a business leader and property owner and did so many things for Southport. So those will be really interesting, and then we will have more coming up uh, in the future. Okay, Bob, can you go to the next slide? Nope. There we go. Our second Tuesday talks, we're continuing those. We have the next three coming up. We have Travis Gilbert on October 13. He'll be talking about um, Bald Head's Light Keepers. So that should be very interesting. And then on the 10th of November, we have Claire McNaught doing Moravian Christmas Traditions. She did this one last year and people really enjoyed it. So this is an encore by popular demand. And then in December, um, Desiree Bridge will be talking about, her topic is Christmas dinner during World War II. Um, we felt this was a very good time to talk about trying to put meals together when there may be some shortages of food and supplies that we've all experienced during COVID. She's going to talk about what it was really like doing it with, um, with rationing in World War II. So that should be really exciting. Second Tuesday talks are the second Tuesday of the month at 10.30 in the morning. Next slide, Bob. Okay, so then we're continuing our uh, Southport Armchair History Program. Um, I'm presenting both of these in October. We'll be talking, this is a brand new program on, uh, as we move into the his, this historic election we're all going through, we are going to be talking about the historic campaign of Margaret T. Harper. And um, Margaret Harper uh, ran, was the first woman to run for statewide office in North Carolina. And so we'll be talking about how um, things have changed and some things that haven't changed since 1968 when she did that. That should be really um, fun and exciting. And then in November, we'll be talking about her mother. So it's a mother-daughter duo. And we'll be talking about Jesse Stevens Taylor, who uh, volunteered with the National Weather Service for over 50 years, I think maybe 60 years. And, um, and what she did during Hurricane Hazel, the only category for hurricane to hit North Carolina in the 20th century. So both of those um, will be really exciting too. Next one, Bob. Next, other way. Okay, and then we're continuing um, our um, Mike Royal, our Southport storyteller. Um, he'll be um, in October, he will be um, telling a story that he wrote called The Old Man. And then uh, in November, he will be um, talking about the James, which is um, an interesting story about him growing up and a man that he knew here in Southport. Uh, those, and then in December, he hasn't decided yet what he's gonna talk about, I, but I know it's gonna be fascinating. Those are the third Monday of every month at seven o'clock. We were doing them uh, strictly on Facebook Live. This last month, we did, just this week, we did Zoom and Facebook Live at the same time which was uh, worked out really well. We got good participation in both mediums and people on Zoom got to ask questions in Facebook Live. They got to ask uh, questions to chat. So we're gonna continue doing it that way. Okay, uh, next one, Bob. Oh, there should be one more slide. I only have. 
Yeah, I saw it earlier. Or maybe I saw it in my own stuff. Uh, okay. Um, what we're doing is, um, all right. What we're doing is we're not, uh, we're not gonna be able to do the holiday home tour this year um, because of COVID. What we are still gonna be participating in, um, in the Winterfest. We're gonna be doing a virtual program like we did for the 4th of July. If you guys remember, we did some videos um, about uh, the women's rights to vote and the 4th of July and we had, a, we had um, pictures that people contributed. So we'll be doing something similar for winter. We have some, um, some stories um, from um, some people in, in the Historical Society, Susie Carson, Mike Royal has a, a poem that he's written we're gonna use. We'll have some interviews with some people in town, but we're also asking for Christmas photos. So if you have any um, photos from your childhood, any photos from the past, uh, in Southport, they can be, it doesn't have to show that it's Southport, they can be inside family photos, outside photos, anything um, that you have, we'll be putting those together in a, a video montage. So please um, send those uh, to info at southporthistoricalsociety.org as soon as possible. We'll come up with a deadline here soon, but soon as possible would be good so we can start putting them together. Okay, that's, um, that's all I have. Does anybody have any questions about any of those programs? Okay. Okay, thank, thank you, Liz. Um, now we can, the, uh, the program for, for this evening, you know, many if not all of you, you know that the society, uh, fundraising with the society is essentially selling, uh, selling, selling books, uh, our, Commemorative bricks, which, which by the way, the um, <clears throat> commemorative bricks will be uh, online and for sale uh, beginning beginning October October first, and we sell those bricks between October first and December 30, 30, 31st. Um, the the bricks now uh, some are placed at the uh, at the old old jail, most bricks now are placed in the, the Fort Johnston uh, walkway. But it, at any any rate, our, our fundraising at activities is going to, you know going to be uh, hurt this this year because we will not be offering the uh, Christmas tour of tour of homes, and that's out of really an, a, an abundance of of caution and respect for our. Uh, for for homeowners and and also uh, participants in the in the in the tours, we certainly plan to be to be certainly hoping and planning to be to be doing that again, uh, but in in twenty 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 one. Uh, so, with fundraising being curtailed, if you, if you will, by the time we're really grateful to have the opportunity. To uh, sell these beautiful images that were created by by Art Newton in the late 1940s through through 1964, uh, what Art Newton painted was really what he saw in in South Southport. So they were, you know, Southport of his his time. But now today, these these really these beautiful images, beautiful paintings, uh, really challenge us to to learn more and uh, keep discovering Southport Southport history, and uh, to I guess the, the best way I can put it because I like that their column so much is the state court pilot folks would would say you know it's you know we're on a, a chance. Uh, a trail of discovery right, to, to find out what it was, what the way, the way it was, the way it was, the way it once was. Right. So that's, that's really the, uh, the gist of our, our program to, tonight. Uh, 
we want to talk about Art, Art Newton and his, and his paintings. And then we'll be talking about individual paintings um, as, as we go along. And I'm sure you, you all recognize uh, from the collage there, you know, the Pilots Tower, which basically Pilots were the, were the first uh, to, to settle in, in Southport, Pilots Tower, Pilots and, and Fishermen, and then to the uh, painting of, of old, old Baldy, and then on the, to the right of old, old Baldy is uh, the Cape Fear light, which you know, some of you may not be familiar, familiar with. Uh, of course, on the next row, the iconic Whitler's, Whitler's Bench, uh, Dan Heller Harrelson's grocery store, and Lou, Lou Hardy's uh, shrimp house sitting on the, on the water, waterfront, and then the, the pictures of Lou, Lou Hardy's uh, shrimp, shrimp boats. That was a, a time, definitely the Harrelson and Hardy uh, painting was before 19 October, I believe 15th of 1954, when Hurricane Hazel, Hazel came and took all of, all of that away from the, the water, waterfront of Southport. And Tommy Harrelson tonight will speak a little bit about that. The bottom, the bottom row, beginning with uh, Mary Ellen Watts Poole's family party boats. And uh, Mary Ellen will speak to that. And then the bottom two, the uh, Gray Burris house on Brunswick Street. And then the, uh, on the painting titled the On the Banks of the Cape, Cape Fear, uh, which was the, the view of the Cape Fear, uh, essentially from what we now call the Walker, the Walker Pike House. So that's, that's what we're going to talk about uh, this, this evening. And we have a, uh, but be really before we get that started, the folks on the screen now are really those that made, made it possible or are making it possible for us to present these uh, prints to you and, and kind of, if you will, bring Art Newton back, uh, back into, uh, into South, Southport so we can uh, share his creative talents with, with you. But first I'd like to thank Tommy and, and Julie Harrelson. Tommy uh, is the author of the book, Southport's Art, Art Newton. And I guess that was about 19, or excuse me, 2012 or 2013 that Tommy published this, this book. And um, it tells the story of Art Newton and his, his paintings. And then to Ricky and Debbie, Debbie Evans uh, for their, their, their help and uh, for, for providing the, the deep clay, uh, beautiful prints of, uh, of Art's work. And then to Julie Newton Geisland, uh, who has given us the, the permission to, uh, re uh, to offer the, the prints to the, to the public. So thank all of thanks to all of you. Uh, Julie um, is, is the the baby sitting in her her daddy's her father's lap, and that's that photograph is from their what was their family family home uh, at the corner of of Bay and Atlantic Atlantic Street. And Julie noted it looks a little bit different. Uh, and that photograph taken around 19, 1960, 64. So Julie, would you like to, to come in? Sure. Can you hear me okay? I yes. unmuted me. <laughs> <laughs> well, first I just wanna say thank you to the Southport Historical Society and, and Bob and Liz and everyone that's been involved in this. Um, the last year since I've been back in Southport, it's just been so nice to be back home again and to see all these beautiful sites that these paintings were made from. 
Um, and I did make some notes so I wouldn't stagger all over the place. So I'm going to pull those up so I can stay on track. So thanks for the opportunity. And I'm sure many of you on here know me and know the story, but I will start at the beginning. Of course, my father, when he died, I was only nine months old. So I never knew the man, the artist, my father. My brothers, who were 13 and 15 years old at the time of his death, they knew him and they lived with him and they saw his weaknesses and his daily life and they have a different view of him than I do since I never knew him. And I guess I've, he's always been a little bit bigger than life to me. Um, even after I learned, as I got older and I learned of some of his struggles and the challenges that he faced in life, I, there were many times where I wished that he hadn't died so I could have seen him at work and known him, but things don't turn out the way we wish sometimes. But growing up in Southport, I mean, he was pretty much famous. I saw his paintings everywhere, I, in the library, in the city hall, when I'd go over to friends' homes, and always in the state port pilot, I couldn't wait to see if one of his paintings or one of his photographs was in the way it was section of the state port pilot. And I would always cut them out and save them, just as my mother had done over the years. And the proof of that was this huge box that she had full of photographs that dad had taken, newspaper articles that she had saved, and she would let me look through these time and time again as I was growing up. And they were just a, a part of who I was. So many pictures of the family filled the box and they kept me entertained for many years. There were other things in the box besides just the photographs. There were a couple of maps that he had made, a little four inch mock-up of the Cape Fear magazine that he published. And mom told me that that publication was supposed to be the first of many. It was, it was going to be a wonderful thing, and indeed it was wonderful, but it didn't take off like he thought it would, so they only did the first one. But there was also a copy of the Hurricane Hazel magazine, and that's floated around forever, and so I grew up knowing about hurricanes and how could they could definitely change the face of the land in a hurry. But it was when I was in high school, the Franklin Square Art Gallery held an exhibit of dad's works. And this was the first time that I really saw the talent that he had and the beauty that he had captured on canvas. And I was just thrilled to see so many of his works gathered together in one place for the first time. And mother would tell me that he would spend months painting and painting and then he would have the exhibits and sell his works. And then he would start over again. So at the time of his death, there were only a few paintings that he had completed. And those paintings hung in our home for as long as I lived there. And they were part of my childhood and growing up years. They were just part of who I was. And so when my mother passed away in 2007, I inherited the last of those items that she still carried with her. And for a while they were in storage, but now I have my own place with nice walls where I can hang these things once again, and I'm very happy about that. But from time to time over the years, mom would be interviewed by someone asking about dad. Well, this only served to add to my respect and awe of the talent that he had and that people were still interested in, in his work so many years after he had died. Well, I never dreamed that one day someone would come to me asking about him. So when Tommy first approached me about writing this book, well, all I could think of was the possibility of seeing some of those paintings again. And I certainly did see those and many more. And it was from the people who had recognized my father's talents and invested in his work all those years ago who brought their treasures to be included in this project. 
And finally, that box of photographs that had entertained me for so many years had a purpose. And there were many things in that box that Tommy found to include in the book. And that just, it all made me happy. So there is a story um, about the painting of the banks of, if we go to the next slide, Bob. So there's some pictures over there on the right of me growing up and in the background, there's always dad's paintings. So that's how I grew up. And then the one on the left on the banks of the Cape Fear River has a very special place in my mind because it was, I guess, during the time when Tommy was gathering the information for the book, someone who owned this painting got in touch with me. She found me and she said, I have something that I want to send to you. So she mailed it to me and she didn't tell me what it was. But when it arrived, there was a story that went with it. And it was this painting. And she said she had found it in a thrift store. And typically she would frame something and hang it right away. But for whatever reason, she never did frame this one. And then when she discovered me on Facebook, she just felt like she wanted to give it to me. So this is a treasure because that dock is the dock that I grew up on. That was about all that was left of it, I guess, after Hurricane Hazel. And I think that looks like mom sitting out there. So it's very personal that that's my dock. And dad, is, dad had his name and he had etched, carved his name in the wood and I carved my name in the wood. And it was a very sad day when I don't even know which hurricane came that finally took away the last remnants of that dock. But that's just one of the many blessings that came about from Tommy wanting to, to work on this book. And so I will be forever thankful to Tommy for creating this wonderful tribute and a keep, keepsake for my family. So when the Southport Historical Society asked me about doing the fundraiser and selling these prints of dad's, I immediately said yes. And I felt like that if the funds could be made to support the Historical Society and its endeavor to maintain the history of the town that my father grew up in and loved so much, I felt like it would make all of his hard work worth it in some way. And there are many days where I wonder how many more works he could have created had he lived beyond 42 years. But God has a way of doing things that we'll never understand. But today I am just grateful that his works have withstood the test of time and captured the South Port that I grew up in and that he loves so much. I often wonder if he saw these changes coming as he worked tirelessly to bring people to his beautiful hometown, because that's what he started out as. Just get the word out there that there's a beautiful place and you need to come. Well, they have done it. <laughs> so let's see, there was one last slide, Bob, that I thought would be appropriate. Oh no, it didn't get in there. That's okay, that's all right. Maybe so, I, think it, I, I think we put it in later. Oh, okay. Well, that's okay. all right. So you can it come was back. on a, I think <laughs> it was 2014, July 3rd, 2nd, 3rd, 4th in there that we had this little reception and had um, many of the paintings on display at the Historical Society. And it was quite astonishing to me that Hurricane Arthur blew through on that weekend. Well, this only served to confirm to me that dad was right there watching his works be admired by so many and that his stormy and short-lived life had not been forgotten. And so thank you all for your love of my dad's artwork and for keeping him alive and keeping the memories of our Southport alive. Well, thank you, Julie, for sharing that all with, with us. Thank you, Julie. That was wonderful. And the book is beautiful. It is a keepsake and a treasure. <laughs> but Tommy Harrelson, I think they're talking about your, your, your book. So you want to defend yourself here? Here I am. I'm here. Uh, First of all, I have to thank Julie. I mean, we're, it's like the Mutual Admiration Society, but had I not had her permission, it could never have happened because uh, you, the artist 
the heirs of the artist have have all the rights to the reproducing the the work. So she was very gracious in letting me do it, never having written a book. I didn't didn't really know what I was getting into, uh, and I blundered through it, but somehow it turned out okay. Uh, I would I started this. It all started with that picture. My dad bought that from Art in 1950, I believe, for the grand total of $15. And we know that because God bless Valley and the, and the family had the, kept all these records and they have a record of, of the, the, the sales and what, what people paid for things and how many people came to the shows. Uh, that little box that Julie talks about was wonderful in that it fleshed out more of his life than we would have ever have known just simply from the paintings. Uh, it was also interesting in that, that uh, you could find the working drawings of the paintings so you could match up with the paintings. You'll see those that throughout the book. But this painting that he bought was Daddy's bed store on the waterfront. He came after he was in World War II for about a year. He was drafted late when he was 34 um, and had three children and spent about the year toward the end of the war. And he came home and decided to open the store on the waterfront. And it was very successful, a little tiny store, but he, he, he did a whale of a lot of business. And uh, I have to believe that Art probably traded that painting for groceries. I mean, who knows? But anyway, they, uh, that's, how, that's how we got it. And then I always liked, it, just, it talked to me, and it, so of course it shows also the Hardy, uh, Lewis Hardy's shrimp, shrimp, but shrimp uh, house, and then his, his truck, in the, and then the, the cedar bench is just to the right, that tree, would, be, would have been at the cedar bench. So that's a, an iconic look of Southport to me. And I had it and displayed it in my store years and years. And then people would come in the store and say, oh, you have an, that's Art Newton. I've got one at home. Would you like to buy it? And that's how I gradually collected a few, an informal collection. And over time, I had enough that when we moved back to Southport, I asked, Julie allowed me to display them in the front of the house near the river. Nothing but Art Newton is in these rooms. So uh, then they started talking to me and said, well, gosh, are there more? So that's when it kind of, is, kind of got the idea to write a book. And somebody else suggested it to me too. So then it was up to, Julie was nice enough to write a letter to the editor asking people to bring their paintings to Ricky Evans and Debbie's gallery. And they were so good to, it was at the, at the depths of the recession after, after the housing crash that they were, didn't have a whole lot of business. So they were able to do this between the two of them in their spare time, which they had plenty. So they, they would let people bring the paintings in, they take them apart, put them back, copy them, put them back together for no charge. But if they needed new matting or new framing, that sort of thing, they got a, they got that business. But I'm sure it was just, if it was a break even, it was a, it was, it'd be a miracle. But they were so, they were the most generous people of all to, to do that for it. But that wouldn't have been, that was also helpful. So, so many people helped with this. And uh, the people that would tell me the stories, like Paul and Betty Dozier and Pat Pittenger and Mr. Sun Carry, different ones. So it was, and it just that one thing led to another. And you'd find, uh, and you'd track these people down and through the, through the inventories and through the stories and cajole them into letting me, trusting me to have them copied and sent back to them and we didn't lose one we almost lost one but we, we, we were actually caught in time but uh it was a quite an adventure and a lot of work but a lot of people made it possible and, and i thank you all for honoring us with the uh letting us do this program tonight and i hope everybody enjoys the paintings and the copies and there ricky does a great job and i have to, i will recommend every one of anybody to buy one of those copies they're beautiful and i with that i'll turn it over to back to bob Thank you, thank you, Tommy. Thanks so so very much for all you, all you and Julie do do for the society. We really, really do appreciate it. Right. Um, now, these uh, our colleague Travis Travis Gilbert uh, is a member of our our board, but but really uh, in, importantly for for this evening, he's the. Uh, uh, educator and uh, uh, responsible for collections at the old old Baldy Found Foundation. Travis, you wanna? Yeah, abs absolutely. 
Well, thank you so much for inviting me to participate this evening. And uh, I very much enjoy learning about Art Newton through Tommy's uh, Second Tuesday program and, and uh, this evening's program. Uh, of course, we have here on the right, uh, Old Baldy Lighthouse. So the oldest standing lighthouse in North Carolina. And then on the left, uh, Old Baldy's younger sister, Cape Fear Light Station, which was completed almost 100 years after Old Baldy uh, in 1903. And, uh, I, you know, I was wondering, well, what was going on at Baldhead when Art Newton came over here in the mid 20th century and uh, captured these two lovely images of the sister lights of Baldhead. And uh, it was, the island was owned by Frank Sherrill. Uh, he's um, probably most well known as being the owner of s and Cafeteria, uh, based out of Charlotte. And uh, Reese Swan, uh, Captain Charlie's uh, son, was the caretaker of Baldhead at this time uh, it, for uh, Frank Sherrill. And this is before the island was really developed. Uh, there was a hotel and a um, 1920s style pavilion that had been constructed on Baldhead previous to the mid 20th century when Art Newton was over here, uh, but really not much else other than a Coast Guard station and uh, these two images. And uh, you can see we uh, found a, a photograph in our collections. It's a postcard actually uh, that Art Newton took uh, from the 1950s. It's one of the only images that we are aware of that includes both Old Baldy Lighthouse in the foreground. And if you look out there on the horizon, on the top left-hand corner, you can just see the black lantern room of Cape Fear Light out there on the horizon. And I must assume after learning from Tommy's Second Tuesday talk that uh, Art had captured this picture on one of those uh, Menhaden spotter planes that they were uh, flying around the area uh, in the mid 20th century. Uh, but if Bob goes back to the other uh, image of the uh, paintings, just very briefly uh, comparing and contrasting these two lights. So Old Baldy is a little over 100 feet tall, whereas Cape Fear Light Station was 150 feet tall. Cape Fear Light Station is unique because it's a skeletal lighthouse. And it is one of the only examples of skeletal lighthouse structures in the entirety of the Carolinas. Uh, these are most common uh, in bays or down in the Florida Keys. Uh, but this skeletal structure, wrought iron and steel with that lantern room placed on top. Uh, now the technology is remarkable because Old Baldy is really an example of 19th century lighthouse technology. She was fueled by whale oil and later kerosene as in a giant Bunsen burner, uh, for example, up top. But Cape Fear Light Station did end operations as being uh, lit by electricity, a uh, 500 watt light bulb up top there being refracted, refracted by one of the nation's most famous and most powerful Fresnel lenses that was able to take a light bulb, 500 watts and refract it or bend it over 18 miles out to sea. And on that note, the biggest difference between the two is Old Baldy is a harbor light. Old Baldy, you wanted to come towards her. She represented the safety of the river and the port there in Southport. Whereas Cape Fear Light Station was a seacoast light. You wanted to stay far away from her light because she not represented safety, but rather the danger of frying pan shoals. These 20 so miles of shifting sandbars that extend from the point of Cape Fear out into that graveyard, the Atlantic, as we like to consider. So uh, I, I was fortunate to buy two prints of these and the, uh, the pilot tower. So I encourage everybody else to um, contribute to this fundraiser. And I'm, I'm so glad that I'll have a piece of Art Newton in my home and a reminder of, of why I'm here and, and how beautiful it is uh, to tell the stories of these two lights. Thank you, Travis. Fine, fine job. Now though, I believe it's party time. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. Thank you, Bob. It is party time. Uh, I'm Mary Ellen Wattspool, and I'm honored to be here tonight to talk 
about this beautiful watercolor. Uh, this watercolor is of my grandfather and my dad's charter boat fleet, the Eidolons 2, 3, and the 4. Uh, the original of this picture uh, hung in my grandparents' house for as long as I can remember, and now it is in my brother Basil and his wife Greta's uh, home. Uh, the name of this picture is called Afternoon Party. And what I would like to tell you is a little bit of terminology about the, uh, the charter boat business. A party is a group of people who would charter the boat for the day and they would come down. Uh, it was not a head boat in that one person, you know, you wait and everybody comes and when you get a boat load, you go out. The boats were actually chartered by one person and they would bring their party with them. Uh, party being the terminology would use, like now when you go in a restaurant, you, they'll say whatever party of five. So this was the term that party was used. Uh, this picture was painted in 1955 by Mr. Newton. Uh, we do not know if it was commissioned by our family or either he painted it and they saw it and uh, and bought it at, at one of his shows. But uh, like I said, it all, it's always hung in, uh, in one of the, in the family home. Uh, it's amazing to me, this picture, and I would like to point out some things because it is so very detailed. And the attention to detail for a watercolor uh, that, that Mr. Newton uh, painted it's just amazing. I want to point out some of those things. You'll see the first boat, the you know, as, as you look at it, that is the Eidolon 2. And the next one is the Eidolon 4. And after that is the Eidolon 3. Uh, note uh, the Eidolon 2 is different from the 4 in that the portholes are shaped differently. I don't know if someone, uh, uh, has a pointer that they can show you where the portholes are, but you'll see that they are round in the Eidolon 2 and they are rectangle in the Eidolon 4. So that detail was in there. Um, note that there is a flying bridge on all of these boats and the flying bridge is at the top and the flying bridge actually has an additional steering wheel, if you will, uh, on the boat so that the captain or the, the, the who is piloting that boat could be on the top and they can see better and they can see the water. And a lot of, of uh, the, the uh, captains would use the flying bridge to bring in the boat and dock it because they could see all around the boat. So I wanted to call attention to that. Uh, what I like about this picture also is the bulkhead, which is another word for a retaining wall. It's interesting in this section where uh, the bulkhead had grass on it and you go, you look right from the grass and, and you're in the water. So I, I found that interesting too. Uh, this is when they were located on Brunswick Street and um, the dock there is uh, it is the location now where um, Sandy Potter Spencer's house is. So that's the location that the uh, boats were docked there during this time. I wanna also note that uh, the family boats, the Eidolons, the three, the three boats, there is a fourth boat in this picture. And that boat, I uh, talked to my brother and he, uh, he recognized it. That boat was the John Ellen uh, it was owned by Captain Walter Lewis, who was Mr. Art Newton's brother-in-law. His wife was Ellen, that was uh, Mr. Art Newton's sister. So uh, that's a little bit about this picture. And if anybody had any questions about it, I'll be glad to answer those. And thank you again. And uh, I do have, uh, I was, uh, this is great. I encourage everyone to find your favorite picture or more. Uh, have them printed. They are beautiful. 
Uh, I have had one printed and matted and framed by Ricky Evans. And at the end of our session tonight, I will show that picture for everyone who'd like to see it. It, it is, uh, the quality is just unbelievable. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank I'd, you like very to, much. I'd like to add something to her story, if I might. This is Tommy again. Her grandfather, Captain Hewland Watts, who was originated along with his wife, Miss Annie May, this fleet, uh, he's known as Crow too, but he is the one who was out in the in the ocean that saw the Roland come in. Mm -hmm. it, was he, it was he that guided those Estonian refugees into the river, into the river basin, and helped rescue them from after their long 37-day trip from Sweden down the coast of Europe to and across to, to here. They he's the one that got them in there. He nobody even had even heard of them, but he he's the he's the man. That man is the one that got them to safety. Right. Thank you, Bob, thank yes. you for adding that, Tommy. Uh, it's Pat Kirkman, and I've got a question. Um, the people in that um, painting, uh, Mary Ellen, are they significant or just just there? Uh, a prob maybe just there. However, uh, if my my brother and I really couldn't recognize them, but if we had to guess, we would think that that on the the Eidolon two, which my dad was the captain of, uh, we think that that would have been him in the flying bridge, because we we were certain that he wouldn't let anybody up on the flying bridge except himself on his <laughs> boat, <laughs> and uh, it was probably Pete Hart that was the, his mate that is on the stern. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks again, Mary Ellen. Great yes, job. sir. Pleasure to be here tonight. That brings us to, to the iconic um, Whitler's bench or, or Cedar bench, as you might, might, might want to call it. And uh, Liz Fuller is going to fill us in some of the history of the, the Whitler's bench. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'm really happy to be talking about the Whitler's Bench tonight, um, in part because our society's newsletter is named after the Whitler's Bench, um, but also because it's such an iconic landmark for Southport. Um, I'm sure that there are some people that come to Southport and um, think that maybe the Whitler's Bench was created by the tourism department as uh, some, something to look like what you'd find in a, in a small, quaint, um, town. Um, but that isn't the case. The Whittler's Bench um, or the Cedar Bench, I think you heard Tommy refer to it as the Cedar Bench. That's what people who've been here a while and grew up here call it. Um, it's been a part of Southport's history for more than 120 years. And recently um, we learned that it has another tie to, um, to Art Newton in that sometimes apparently he would um, put some of his paintings that were up for sale. He would um, hang them up at the Whitler's Bench and show them there in the middle of the town. And so some of the people who bought the paintings that ended up in Tommy's book actually bought them um, at the Whitler's Bench. So that was a nice connection. So it's been around for 120 years uh, or more, uh, but very few people know its uh, origin. I think most people assume that the city maybe put the bench there and then people started to congregate. But it actually happened in reverse. Um, that spot, fishermen and other men began to, to congregate there before there was a bench. Um, back in the late 1890s, there was a, a tree or a few trees growing in that spot. And men would stand there under the trees. They would, they would look out at the river. They would watch the weather conditions. They would talk, swap fishing stories and just sort of hang out there. And on Howe Street, um, not far from that spot, there was a barber shop. And the owner of the barber shop was a man named Paxton Tharp. Uh, everybody called him Mr. Pack. And day after day, as he was cutting hair and shaving people, um, he would look out at those men standing under those trees talking. And he, after a while, he got an idea. And he thought, what those men need is a bench to sit on. So he actually hired someone to build a bench. And uh, the men really appreciated it. And so now they had the perfect spot to sit uh, under the shade of the trees and to talk and, and watch the boats on the water and to talk about the weather and to talk about uh, fish. And, 
um, and then they would settle in and they would stay longer. And I think it was really thoughtful of Mr. Pack to do this, but I also think that he was a clever businessman and I think that he knew if those men sat around, uh, sat around there long enough that eventually they'd start to have the idea, hey, you know, I think I'll go over and get a shave or I'll go over and get a haircut. So it kind of became maybe a, uh, an outdoor waiting room or an overflow for him. Now, of course, the men didn't just talk about fishing. They also talked about politics. And during the presidential election year of 1896, uh, there were two trees near the bench. And uh, the men started calling one McKinley and the other Brian. Um, sort of like today, we might call it Trump and Biden. So then I guess the idea was that those who were for McKinley would kind of congregate around the McKinley tree and those that were for Brian would kind of congregate around that one and then they would discuss their different uh, views. And since about two thirds of Brunswick County went for Brian and a third went for McKinley, there were probably some spirited debates. So while the men were talking, uh, they would also pull out their knives and they would start whittling. And sometimes they would have a piece of wood to whittle on. Uh, they would often use broken up boards from crates that came on the, the ships. Um, sometimes they, would, they wouldn't have a, a board, so they would start carving on the bench and they would sometimes um, just carve pieces off of it or they would carve their initials into it. Sometimes they would cut a limb off of the trees uh, that were around it. Um, they say that a huge number of knives were sold by the local stores around the Whittler's Bench to support all that whittling. And Kate Stewart once said that enough good white pine to make several boats was whittled into piles of shavings at that bench. But all that whittling plus the salt air and the weather took their toll on the bench. Over the last 120 plus years, uh, it's been replaced numerous times since Mr. Pack first had it built. And the trees near the bench um, have come and gone. Now, some of them have lived full lives and have died natural deaths, um, but others have not made it that long. It's not an ideal place for a tree to grow. Uh, the salt air isn't all that good for it. And um, these days, the, the fumes from the cars, um, but a lot of times hurricanes and storms have taken the trees out. And so um, they've been replaced. And then uh, over time, sometimes they've been cedars, sometimes they've been poplars, sometimes they've tried different trees. And then some years like this one, there's been no tree and people have just enjoyed the view of the water. Um, some years the town is celebrated by putting a Christmas tree there and decorating it. But just like the town folk, have argued about the presidential candidates, they've also argued over the bench. There have always been those who preferred the tree and there have been those who preferred the view. So the Whittler's bench has been a real part of Southport's history for over 120 years. It's far from being some gimmick created to entice tourists, it's an authentic, enduring symbol of Southport's values. To gather together, to share stories, to discuss our differences, and to appreciate the natural beauty of this town by the river. That's what I got. Any questions for Liz? Well, thank you. Thanks, Liz. Julie, this is the this is the lost photo photograph. Yes, I see that. <laughs> <laughs> you want to add any anything more? I'm no. I'm, I think you can tell by the picture. I was so excited, and I'm still so excited by the book. I love to show it to my friends, and um, I think it's 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 just a treasure. Thank you, Tommy. <laughs> okay. Yes, thanks to Tom, Tommy and to uh, Julie and to, to Ricky and Debbie Debbie Evans. Thanks to all of you from the Historical Society. Okay. Um, now, you may be wondering where, where could, may I buy one of these uh, prints or even Tommy Carlson's book? And the answer is the Southport Historical Society's um, online store. And that happens to be the, the address, the URL for the, for the store. Uh, I don't know if we, we mentioned that 
the prints come in two sizes, eight and a half by, by 11, which are $25, $25 and 11 and a half by 14, which are, are $40. And they're, they're beautiful, they're beautiful. Uh, I'm gonna, going to stop the, the share so that Mary Ellen can, can show us the, uh, the print that she has of the, of the painting afternoon party. Okay, uh, I hope everyone can see me now. Uh, since I'm talking, I was told that my picture would come up. I'm going to show you the picture um, uh, that I had uh, uh, printed that Ricky Evans did. And he also, uh, Ricky, I hope everybody can see this well. Ricky you you also. On speaker view. If you put your, your uh, computer on speaker view, Mary Ellen should get big. I'm sorry. I was saying if everybody put their uh, oh, okay. speaker view instead of grid view, then you should be big. Okay, here is the picture. Uh, Rick, I got the larger size. Uh, Ricky Evans did mat it and frame it. Uh, I had it's it's really beautiful. The framing is just unbelievable. I had it framed with uh, cherry wood, and uh, it is quite uh, lovely. Thank you. That looks great. That it does. I'm very happy to have it. I mean, uh, we have the original. My brother has that, so it was wonderful that I could have a copy made. And uh, the quality is just unbelievable. And uh, uh, Ricky and his wife, Debbie, do a wonderful job of uh, matting and framing. Thank you. Thank well, you. That, that's really our, our, our program for this evening and our, our meeting. Uh, although before we adjourn, I would like Pat Kirkman to introduce her guest to us, if that, that would be okay. Okay, Bob, I'm going to try to do that. Let's see. Do you see me? Do you see us? There we go. Say hello. Hello. I'm so glad I'm retired. I can never do any of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's but it's great. It's great. <laughs> no, it's wonderful. No, we need to pass the torch to people who know it's the 21st century. Oh. <laughs> So, so, to see you. so you see Musette, uh, yeah. she's here visiting, and uh, I'm very privileged to have her at my house for a few days. I can't wait to see everything. I want to see the waterfront. I woke up one morning and saw a picture on the front of the Wall Street Journal, and it was South Point's waterfront. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> just wonderful. Wow, big time. And I just have to say this, although she may not want me to. Tamara is her birthday, so happy birthday, Musette. Yes, I've had, my birthday. Yeah. I've had my birthday many a time at the September meeting of the Historical Society. <laughs> All it got me was to be first in line, but that was worth it. <laughs> and this is the first time Musette's been exposed to Zoom. <laughs> but I'm impressed that you can get 100 people in one year as new members. I mean... That's remarkable. That's just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. We were, uh, we don't know whether quite believe, no, it's, 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 it's really a tribute to the, to the folks who put these, these uh, presentations and classes to, together. Brought it, you know, we have now have, met, we have one member who's in, in uh, Austin, Texas. And not only has he, has he become a member, he was a, a Southport native, but he's doing a program for us every month. Wonderful. Southport storytelling from Austin, Austin, Texas. So that's that's kind of you know demonstrates the the value of um, of the technology uh, if you can if you can operate it. Uh, <laughs> but one of the good things is you know when Susie had retired that she died. Well, I was thinking, what are we going to do? But then Pat came along, 
Uh -huh. when, when, Pat, that. when we decided that I thought, what are we going to do? And then here came Liz and Lisa and Bob first to <laughs> welcome them. I, I think it's wonderful the way it keeps going that we all have benefited from what someone else did previously for us, kept the doors open. And now you've got the airwaves. It's just amazing to me. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Yaskel. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any other any other questions? Anything for the good of the good of the order? Uh, if if not not, I'll I'll entertain a motion. Um, to... um, I have a question. If people want to buy bricks, where do they where do they go? The, the bricks are the bricks are us website. I don't have that URL with. with oh, me. okay. I think it's bricksrs.com slash Southport Historical Society. So, uh, uh, details open up October first. I'm I'm sorry, uh, Liz. This is Mary Ellen. I was the guinea pig for the um, for the bricks are us. I've already ordered mine. We to make sure Liz made sure that everything flowed properly as well as Scott Lynn. The easiest thing to do is to go on the Southport Historical Society website first. And you go in the store and you will see the little picture of Fort Johnston and it says uh, commemorative bricks. Click on that and it will take, it has the link for Bricks R Us that will take you to the donation page. Because if you go to Bricks R Us and try to find it, there are thousands of organizations. So I would suggest that you go to the Southport Historical Society website first, go on there, click on, you can go to Bricks, to the donation, the site from there, and then you come back to the Historical Society webpage to put in your reference number and to pay for it. And this year we are having credit card payments. So it makes it much easier for folks to do that. Sorry, I just wanted to, I just wanted to impart my uh, experience. <laughs> Thank you, Mary, Mary Ellen. Yes, sir. This, this has been our first meeting of the Southport Historical Society. We're new members, Myrtle Beach, and love all the presentations you've been doing. I've been on numerous ones, and tonight has been so awesome with the different presentations. Just wanted to let you all know how much we're enjoying it. Thank you, Mrs. Jones. Bob, it's Pat again. Yes, Maybe we could get all of Southport to buy a brick this year instead of going on a home tour. <laughs> How's that? For <laughs> that. For that. A good idea. I think while we were talking, I, I heard somebody make a motion to, to adjourn. I, I'm also sure I heard that that second seconded. And I just want to uh, show my friend uh, Musette that I do have to gavel. So I, I can, with with authority, close this meeting. But it's been good to, to see you, Missette. I hope I hope I see you uh, soon. Okay. Yeah. Thank Again. you. I've got. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate All right. it. All right. So I'm going to declare this meeting adjourned. <laughs>